Dragon of the North, Part 2 One day, the maiden took him into a secret chamber where a little gold box was standing on a silver table. Pointing to the box, she said, Here is my greatest treasure, whose like is not to be found in the whole world. It is a precious gold ring. When you marry me, I will give you this ring as a marriage gift and it will make you the happiest of mortal men. But in order that our love may last forever, you must give me for the ring three drops of blood from the little finger of your left hand. When the youth heard these words, a cold shudder ran over him, for he remembered that his soul was at stake. He was cunning enough, however, to conceal his feelings and to make no direct answer. But he only asked the maiden, as if carelessly, what was remarkable about the ring. She answered, No mortal is able entirely to understand the power of this ring, because no one thoroughly understands the secret signs engraved upon it. But even with my half-knowledge, I can work great wonders. If I put the ring upon the little finger of my left hand, then I can fly like a bird through the air wherever I wish to go. If I put it on the fourth finger of my left hand, I am invisible and I can see everything that passes around me, though no one can see me. If I put the ring upon the middle finger of my left hand, then neither fire, nor water, nor any sharp weapon can hurt me. If I put it on the forefinger of my left hand, then I can produce whatever I wish. I can, in a single moment, build houses or anything that I desire. Finally, as long as I wear the ring on the thumb of my left hand, that hand is so strong that it can break down rocks and walls. Besides these, the ring has other secret signs, which, as I said, no one can understand. No doubt it contains secrets of great importance. The ring formerly belonged to King Solomon, the wisest of kings, during whose reign the wisest men lived. But it is not known whether this ring was ever made by mortal hands. It is supposed that an angel gave it to wise King Solomon. The youth had a cunning idea. I do not think it is possible that the ring can have all the power that you say it has, he said. Do let me try and see if I can do these wonderful things. The maiden, suspecting no treachery, gave him the magic ring. The youth asked her to remind him what finger he must put the ring on so that he could fly. Oh, the little finger of your left hand, the maiden answered laughing. The youth did so and he soared into the air just like a bird. When the maiden saw him flying away, she thought he was playing, but the young man never came back. Then the maiden saw that she was deceived and bitterly repented that she had ever trusted him with the ring. The youth never halted in his flight until he reached the dwelling of the wise magician who had taught him the language of birds. The magician delightedly set to work at once to interpret the secret signs engraved upon the ring. But it took him seven weeks to make them out clearly. Then he told the youth that he must have an iron horse cast with little wheels under each foot. He must have huge iron chains and pegs made. And he must be armed with a spear as long and thick as a tree which he would be able to wield by means of the magic ring upon his left thumb. And he told the youth how to use these to defeat the dragon. The young man thanked the magician sincerely and quickly flew home 
through the air. After some weeks, he heard people say that the terrible dragon of the north was not far off. The king announced publicly that he would give his daughter in marriage as well as a large part of the kingdom to whoever should free the country from the dragon. The youth went to the king and everything was prepared as he requested. The young man rode out upon the iron horse to meet the dragon, pushing the spear against the ground as if he were pushing off a boat from the land. The dragon had his monstrous jaws wide open. The youth trembled with horror and his blood ran cold. Yet, he did not lose his courage. But, holding the iron spear upright in his hand, he brought it down with all his might, right through the dragon's lower jaw. Then, Quick as lightning, he sprang from his horse before the dragon had time to shut his mouth. A fearful clap like thunder, which could be heard for miles around, now warned him that the dragon's jaws had closed upon the spear. When the youth turned, he saw the point of the spear sticking up high above the dragon's upper jaw and knew that the other end must be fastened firmly to the ground. But the dragon had got his teeth fixed in the iron horse, which was now useless. The youth now hastened to fasten down the chains to the ground by the means of the enormous iron pegs which he had been provided. The death struggle of the dragon lasted three days and three nights. In his writhing, he beat his tail so violently against the ground that at ten miles away, the earth trembled as if with an earthquake. When he at length lost power to move his tail, the youth, with the help of the ring, took up a stone which twenty ordinary men could not have moved and beat the dragon so hard upon the head that soon, the dragon lay lifeless before him. You could fancy how great was the rejoicing when the news spread abroad that the terrible dragon was dead. His conqueror was received into the city with as much celebration as if he had been the mightiest of kings. The king's daughter was delighted to marry the hero and a magnificent wedding was celebrated. But everyone forgot amid the general joy that they ought to have buried the dragon's monstrous body, for it began to have such a bad smell that the whole air was poisoned, which destroyed many hundreds of people. In this distress, the king's son-in-law resolved to seek help once more from the eastern magician, to whom he at once travelled through the air in the form of a bird. However, the witch maiden had discovered by magic where the youth and her ring were. She changed herself into an eagle and watched up in the air until the bird came in sight. Then she pounced upon him and tore the ring from the ribbon he wore around his neck. Then, the eagle flew down to the earth with her prey and the two stood face to face once more in human form. Now, villain, you are in my power and you must pay, cried the witch maiden. She put the ring upon her left thumb, lifted the young man with one hand and walked away with him to a deep cave. The maiden chained the young man's hands and feet to the rock so that he could not escape and declared, Here you shall remain until you die. I will bring you enough food to prevent you from dying of hunger, but you will need never to hope for freedom any more. And with these words, she left him. The old king and his daughter waited anxiously for many weeks 
for the prince's return. But no news of him arrived. They sent messengers far and wide to look for him. After searching for seven long years, they, by good luck, met with the old magician who had interpreted the signs on King Solomon's ring. The magician soon found out what they wished to know and went himself to the cave where the unfortunate prince was chained up. The magician released him by the help of powerful magic and took care of the prince until he became strong enough to travel. When he reached home, he found that the old king had died, so that he was now raised to the throne. And now, after his long suffering, came prosperity, which lasted to the end of his life. But he never got back the magic ring, nor has it ever again been seen by mortal eyes.